woman passed away, went to heaven, appeared before St. Peter. He said, I'm assuming you'd like to go here. She said, yes, what do I have to do to go into heaven? He said, to spell love. She said, spell love? He said, yes. She said, uh, L-O-V-E. He said, you're in. <laughs> That's it. So she's enjoying eternity. When the Peter says, listen, I've got an errand to run. Would you mind just manning the front desk here while I'm gone? You know the drill. She said, sure, I'd be glad to. So she's stationed there, and she sees her husband approaching. He said, wow, you're finally here. He said, yes, isn't this great? She said, well, what did you do after I passed away? He said, well, a couple of weeks after you passed away, I married the girl in the cul-de-sac that we knew. We got your insurance money, traveled around the world, bought a villa in Italy, one along the French Riviera, and pretty much that was our life. So, what's the deal? She said, I'm manning the desk here. He said, how do I get in? She said, I need you to spell chrysanthemum. <laughs> what amazes me about all those heaven and hell jokes is that none of them are accurate. Heaven jokes, Peter's not manning the gate, it's not a matter of good works, if you trusted in Jesus the Savior. And even the hell jokes, I don't mean the jokes that I tell, I mean the jokes that are about hell. None of them are accurate. It's always some big pit with fire in it and Satan standing there with a pitchfork. Well, Actually, today we're going to look at that subject of hell. We're studying Second Peter. And his theme, as we know by now, is that God has attributes that are his by nature alone, but he shares them with those of us who have been born again by trusting in Jesus as our Savior. His attributes come down the pipeline. They're manifested in our lives as qualities. Now that pipeline is knowledge, knowing God. Therefore, the more we know God in a personal way, the more that pipeline is open and the more his attributes flow into our lives as qualities. And these are not religious qualities. These are qualities that make a tangible difference in our lives. And every passage in Second Peter... He either talks about God's attributes, the qualities we get, or the pipeline of knowing God. And that's the case here. In this section today, we learn something more about God. And specifically, we learn about God and his relationship to hell. That's a very difficult topic. And frankly, if there was one point of doctrine I would remove, it would be hell. It's very difficult because... Unbelievers have a serious problem with hell. And sometimes it's hard to get over that barrier of this whole concept of hell. So the questions people ask are, how could a loving God send people to hell? How could God punish people forever? How could God put people in a pit with fire and brimstone for all eternity because they rejected him? Now before we go to our little Christian cliches, I'd like to say that I would have a problem with that also. I would have a problem with God punishing people forever with fire. One reason I would have a problem with it is that there's a passage, it's Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is separation, is what that means. Alright, if the wages of sin is separation from God. That means that once a person is separated from God, the penalty has been paid, doesn't it? It doesn't say the wages of sin is death plus an unspecified amount of punishment later in hell. Why in the world would God send people to a terrible place like that and then just keep punishing them? And actually, I think most people think that the worse that you live, the worse the person that you were, the more God ratchets up the heat. And unfortunately, I think many Christians have that same faulty view of hell and God that the unbeliever does. And unfortunately, our faulty understanding of hell leads us to a faulty understanding of God himself, and it leads us to a wrong understanding of how God treats us. If we think that God's going to do that to the unbeliever, we will question what he'll do with us. Today we'll look at what both Peter and Jude say about hell. But first I want to make it clear, there is a heaven and there is a hell. 
and there's a clear delineation of who goes where. Second Peter 2 9 the Lord knows how to rescue the righteous from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Very clear. Righteous people go to heaven, unrighteous go to hell. But we have to clarify quickly what does it mean to be righteous. And righteous is, believe it or not, righteous has nothing to do with behavior. Isn't that a weird concept? It's kind of hard to shake, isn't it? That righteousness has nothing to do with behavior or performance. Righteous people, by definition, are people who at one point in their life have said, I'm not righteous. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I'm believing that when Jesus died on that cross, in himself he carried my sins. He was my substitute. And therefore when he died, he paid the full penalty for my sins. He paid the debt of separation to God. Those of us who have done that one time in our life, and by the way, what I love about that is that there are no take backs. If we say that to God and say, I believe your son died for my sins, save me, there's nothing we can do to unravel that. Now, the unrighteous person is very simply somebody who's never done that. That's righteous and unrighteous. It's all based on the cross. So Peter is saying is that during our lives as believers, God keeps delivering us. And our ultimate destination is heaven. Now, for the unbeliever, he has trials also. Does God deliver him? Well, God certainly does. God certainly delivers unbelievers from trials. That's the amazing thing about God's mercy. When people say God doesn't hear the prayer of the unbeliever, God doesn't help the unbeliever, that's ridiculous. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And he does deliver unbelievers from trials, but the difference is their ultimate destiny is hell. And there's no way around that. But what is hell like? Peter now gives a picture of a person in hell. 2 Peter 2.17, springs without water, mists driven by a squall, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. But that does not seem like a picture of a person in hell, but it is. Now actually, Peter borrowed from his buddy Jude. Peter's thinking was, well, if Jude already wrote it, why should I? I like the way he thinks. He borrowed heavily from Jude. And Jude gives a very detailed picture of a person in hell. What a person in hell looks like. And I'm going to look at this quick bullet list, and then we'll explain it. Here's a picture of a person in hell, Jude 1.12, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by squalls, autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own torment like foam, wandering stars, for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. That's a picture of a person in hell. You notice you don't see anything about flames, of people writhing in agony. You don't see any picture of demons or Satan hanging around. That's a picture of a person in hell we just read. Now, that doesn't seem that terrible. Actually, he's describing a horror. And hell is actually worse than a pit of fire. So Jude here gives us a picture The final result of a person in hell. Now Peter does us a great service because Peter now rewinds. So we have this picture of a person in hell in Jude. Peter now does a flashback of the person's life to show how did he end up in hell. And Peter shows every step of the way by which the person in hell has paved his own way to hell. He has even created his own hell. And he has created the degree of punishment which will be inflicted on him. So what's amazing about hell? Hell is not a place that God sends people to. Hell is a place that people march to willfully. And hell is not a place where God punishes people. Hell is the place where the unbeliever punishes himself. That's what we're going to see today. Hell is a place where the unbeliever has made his own hell and turns up or down his own thermostat in hell. God has nothing to do with it. 
Now here in a very few verses, Peter gives 13 traits, 13 attributes that a person develops as he's paving his way to hell. And one thing we'll notice is that we don't find necessarily horribly evil sins. 2 Peter 2.10 Here's the first feature of people who are unbelievers and preparing their own hell. They pursue the flesh in its corrupt desires. That's the number one feature of the unbeliever going to hell. He looks out for number one. His life is geared towards getting his needs met. Now that's true for everybody in a sense. We all have to get our needs met to live. We have to live, we have to breathe, we have to drink water. So in a sense, everybody looks out for number one. However, it becomes out of control when those desires are shaped by what's called corrupt desires. And the word corrupt is not as bad as it sounds. It just means in line with the fallen nature of the world. So the point Peter is making is, and I'll expand on it, Everybody, we all have to get our needs met. However, people start paving the way to hell as an, when they're an unbeliever when they start having issues with what's really needed. Their own desires become corrupted in accordance with the falling world, so they start pursuing things that don't matter for their own self. And the second feature, the second mile marker on the way to hell is that they despise authority. What that means is here's an unbeliever, he's never trusted in Jesus as Savior and he's looking out for himself looking out for number one and he doesn't want to answer to anybody. He doesn't want to have to give account to anybody. Any human being or even to God. He starts to withdraw within himself. Now the third feature of this unbeliever paving his way to hell is another example where all these terms aren't always bad. Here's a word translated daring. It actually means adventurous. And that is a good quality. That means he's willing to try something new. That's not a bad quality. However, when it's combined with number four, it becomes a bad quality. Number four is self-willed. Will is to himself. Now we combine those. He's adventurous, but he's self-willed. And that means this. This unbeliever paving his way to hell, he may have a sense of adventure. And that may be attractive to us. He may be engaging initially and willing to try new things. However, it's corrupted because his desires for adventure are really our desires to please himself. He's not out to be adventurous to bring other people along so others can enjoy it. It's for self-gratification. So if he won a basketball game, he wouldn't be singing, we are the champions. He'd be singing, I did it my way. <laughs> but you see the pattern? He's starting to withdraw within himself. He's starting to spiral in, get his needs met. Be adventurous for my own sake. Despising authority, spiraling in. Now, unfortunately, the more he spirals in, he's spiraling in to his inner core. What is at the inner core of the unbeliever? Is there anything good? No, it's all corrupted. So, you see, he's spiraling in, and now he spirals down. Because the next feature, number five, he is like unreasoning animals is the way it's translated, and I couldn't think of a better way to translate it because there's not a word for this. Those of us who have pets know very well our pets can reason, right? Anybody who has a dog or a cat know that they can reason. That's not what he's saying. It's a very odd word, and of course, once again, it's a word that's only found in the Bible here in Second Peter. Very literally. I'm reluctant to say what it means very literally because it doesn't really mean that. It just means without word, without logos. And logos was the ancient Greek word for power, words of power. I'm going a long way to tell you that what he's describing is an animal in a cage. 
And that's feature number five of how a person prepares, he paves his own road to hell and makes his own hell, is this, as he's spiraling in, he's looking out for number one. Even his sense of adventure is not to share, it's to gratify himself. He doesn't want input from others, so the picture Peter's painting is, he's going into his room, he's shutting the door, he's getting more and more withdrawn. Now he climbs into a cage and shuts the door behind him as he spirals in. Well, can it be pleasant living in a cage? Well, no. So now we have some tension. Because feature number six of paving the way to hell is he's raging. You've heard of road rage? This person has cage rage. (laughs) He's stuck inside that cage. He's mad because he's in the cage. Nothing ever works out for me. Nobody's here for me. It's all me. Well, yeah, he made it all him. So now he's locked himself in a house. Now he locks himself in his room. Now he locks himself in a cage. And now he's all furious. Where is everybody? So now he's raging. But here's the tension. He's raging where they have no knowledge. They have no knowledge. That's number seven. He combines raging with the lack of knowledge. He's describing an extreme amount of tension within that unbeliever. He's raging, but he doesn't know why. And now he has no knowledge, and in Scripture that is a sense of darkness. So now he's withdrawing from other people. He goes in his own house. He goes in his own room. He goes in the cage. He shuts the door. He turns off the light, and now he's raging. Where's the light? I need some help. He's paving his own hell. Blaming other people. And now he has a faulty view of other people. Point number eight on the way to hell is having eyes full of adultery is the way it's translated. That's literally what it means. However, the expression means something bigger than that. The term is a broader term. The word is bigger than sexual adultery. It's referring to seeing other people as their for his convenience. And if the other person does not supply what he wants, what does he do? He keeps spiraling back in. Spiraling and spiraling. And now it gets worse and worse. That becomes a pattern. Point nine. Having a will which is exercised in greed. He's describing a process Here's a person whose desires are shaped by getting what he wants. He depends on other people to give him what he wants. It doesn't happen. So he goes to his house, he goes to his room, he goes to his cage. He locks himself in. He keeps spiraling in himself. He's got cage rage, but he won't get out. He's self-willed. He doesn't interact with others. He doesn't interact with God. He keeps spiraling in. However, the more he spirals in, the worse he gets because remember the inner core of an unbeliever is evil. So he's making it worse and worse on himself. The more he spirals into that core, the more he's spiraling into that core of evil. And so point number 10 is that these unbelievers paving the way to hell are... It's called Accursed Children. Sounds like a horror movie. It's actually Sons of Cursedness. I didn't know if that was a word, but it went through spell check. And we know if Microsoft says it's right, then it's right. Now, what does it mean, sons of? We've seen that before. That means by nature, doesn't it? Jesus was the Son of God. That doesn't mean he was the offspring of God. What does that mean? By nature, he is God. We now are sons and daughters of God. By nature, remember our nature is to listen. We are sons of listening. He is saying that this unbeliever is a son of cursedness. And he's referring to what happened to the human race. You see, every human being is born with the image and likeness of God, which is passed down from Adam. However, Although it's within the person, it is external to our soul. 
the image and likeness of God that is within every human being is external to the person's real nature. It's planted alongside. By the way, the difference between us believers is that we have a new nature, which is now the real us. See the difference? When we're born again, we get the nature of Jesus, and that replaced our inner core. So our inner core is not evil. Our inner core is not sinful. Our inner core is perfect. The unbeliever has the image and likeness of God planted alongside or maybe external to his evil core. All right, so as this unbeliever now spirals more and more inwardly, he's spiraling to his inner core of evil, and what is he spiraling away from? The image and likeness of God. That's his problem. So now he's getting worse and worse. Now it may not be externally worse and worse. Because he still now cares what people think to a degree. Because he still may want to use them. So there may be some congeniality very superficially. But internally he's withdrawing more and more. And he's raging more and more. And ironically God keeps knocking on the door and saying you want out of the cage? God keeps showing up and turning the light on. That keeps happening. So point number 11 is they constantly are getting off of the narrow way. That's what it says. They are constantly getting off the narrow way. They keep going astray. Now the narrow way he's referring to is found in the book of Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, The broad way, the way that seems right is the way to hell. The narrow way that very few find is the way to salvation. That's the cross, of course. So incredibly, here's this man who keeps going home, turning off the lights, going into his own room, turning off the lights, locking the door, going into his cage, shutting off the light, locking the cage. The guy keeps turning the switch back on saying, here's the way out, and the man won't take it. Blaming other people, blaming God, but he won't get out of the cage. God keeps coming by, turn the light on. Look, just open the door, get out, come to me. God won't do it. Then he gets mad because he's still in the cage. And why won't God help me? Ironically, God just keeps coming. But what happens is that cage becomes more and more comfortable. He actually starts to sort of enjoy being in that cage by himself. And as that happens, we have a new development. Peter points out this classic story from the Old Testament. Having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke for his own transgression. For a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. I'm sure you all know that story. Balaam was this prophet. He was one of those shadowy types. He listened to Yahweh, but he listened to others too demons. The Israelites were coming out of Egypt, about to make their way up to Canaan, and they approached the country of Moab. And the king of Moab was Balak. And so Balak hires Balaam and says, I'll pay you some money if you'll curse Israel. Balaam goes back and forth, I can't do that. I only do what Yahweh says. However, if the money's right, he'll go with somebody else. You can read the whole story in Numbers 22. I'll make it very brief. Basically, Balaam keeps waffling back and forth. God tells him, don't go to meet these people. Balaam goes anyway. God sends an angel to stop him. Balaam's donkey sees it. Balaam doesn't. The donkey won't go, so he starts hitting the donkey. And the donkey starts talking. Hey, man, why are you hitting me? Read the story. It's in Numbers 22. One of the amazing things is... If a donkey starts talking to me, I'm just not going to answer him casually. (laughs) That's what strikes me about that story. Donkey says, why'd you hit me? Guy says, because you were doing this. (laughs) Yes. Well, Peter makes that point on purpose. He's making a very disturbing point. Peter's saying this unbeliever paving his way to hell and creating his own cage is going to be airlifted into hell. He keeps retreating. He keeps turning the light out. And as he keeps drawing further within himself, spiraling in, he actually reaches a level lower than an animal. Think about it. 
The only definition we have of a human being is somebody who has the image and likeness of God in him. According to the first two chapters of Genesis, that's what defines a human being. Human beings were created on the same day as the other land animals. So when scientists start saying human beings are like animals, don't complain. Yes, that's exactly the case. A human being without the image and likeness of God is just a biological primate. I suppose... I don't know what a human being is without the image and likeness of God. And I tell you what, nobody else does either. We don't know any human beings who don't have the image and likeness of God except in Washington. (laughs) So what is a person without the image and likeness of God? The answer is we don't know. But obviously it's lower in some cases than an animal and so Peter uses the example of Balaam to say this person can get so low don't expect anything from him because his reasoning is less than an animal. A donkey had to set him straight. And that's feature number 12. As the person paves his way to hell he begins to lose his identity as a human being. He's got cage rage. He's still in tension. Why is he in tension? He's in internal turmoil. I can't get out. But he didn't want to get out. He's got the key. And so here's point 13. Professing freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. That's an awkward translation. I realize that the translators put the word themselves in is that they recognize that there is a middle voice here. But so basically, let me tell you what he's saying. Professing freedom while they have made themselves slaves of corruption. So here's the picture. Point number 13 of a person preparing his way to hell. He's thinking, I'm free. He really thinks he's free. I'm free to do whatever I want. However, he's rejecting the only path he has to freedom. This unbeliever thinks, well, if I reach out to God, he's going to put rules and regulations on me. I want to be free. I'm not going to be under the authority of God or anybody else. What they don't realize is the only way to be free is to spiral out to God. Realize that? The only way to be free is to go to the cross. That's freedom. I wonder how many Christians understand that. That our life in Christ is a life of freedom. And that's because we can live our lives with well-being because we have his possessing power. We have his knowledge. We have his resilience. We have a life of well-being and, yes, freedom. Christians are the only human beings who are free. And that's why I love it when all these apostles refer to themselves as a doulos, a bond slave. It's the way it's translated. There's not a good word. A bond servant in that time meant somebody who said, I'm going to be your slave because that master had the reputation of setting his slaves free. That's doulos, whenever you see slave. So this person is now, his reasoning is all faulty. He's thinking, I'm not going to do any of that religious stuff because I want to be free. And he's the one, he's locked in a cage. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. He's let his own self-desires put him in that cage. And absolutely amazingly, God keeps coming into the room and turning the light on and saying, you want some light? You want to get out of the cage? It's absolutely amazing. God keeps coming back. But it makes it worse. Verse 20, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Now what that means is, in an intellectual way, they understand the process. They have heard the gospel. They may have associated with Christians and gotten a little temporary relief from their cage. So God says, well, you would think that put them out on a furlough, give them a little taste of life, they would want it. Do they want it? No. What do they want to do? Go back to their cage. If after this happened they are again entangled in them, and them is their own ways, their own cage, and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. Isn't that ironic? Someone hears the gospel, someone gets a taste of freedom, a taste of light, or they reject it, 
Well, now they're worse off than they were because now, you see, they know what they were missing. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Now, what is that holy commandment handed on to the unbeliever? I only found one. I found one commandment in the Bible that was given to the entire human race. And it's in Acts 17.30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance. Now, I love that line. Paul is being somewhat ironic. He's saying, okay, you're saying you never heard? Okay, right. I'll grant you, let's just say you never heard. They really have. He's okay, but fine. Okay, you never heard. Yeah, right. He says, now, regardless, God is now, and the word is commanding. God is now commanding to men that all people everywhere should change their mind. That's the only commandment I could find in the whole Bible of the whole human race, and it's just change your mind. It translated repent. Has too many religious connotations to me. It just means change your mind. What does he mean? He's saying, God's looking down at the world, a whole human race, everybody's in their cage. Everybody's turned off the light. They're in their cage, locked in there. And God says, change your mind. Trust me, living in a cage and eating seeds isn't good. Trust me. So God wants people to say, hey, I thought I was free. I've been in a cage. I thought I was having fun. I'm in misery. I thought I was in the light. I'm in the dark. I thought I was okay. I'm not okay. I need Jesus. Reach out to the cross. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. God's commanding everybody to do that. Most do not. Most keep making their own hell. And you know what? That cage that I've just described, the cage that's in the darkness by itself, basically, at the end of that person's life, Now, there's an interim process of Hades. But let's just say, on to hell. God does not punish that person. God never steps in and punishes the person. You know what God does? God takes the cage that they've made where they want to live and puts it in eternity and gives it to them. I heard a noted pastor say that God loves everybody, but God hates people in hell. Oh, please. You know that hell is God's infinite love? You know why? He's giving them what they want. I believe God does not have a place designed full of fire and brimstone and He casts unbelievers into it. Hell is God's infinite, ultimate love if people really do not want to be with Him and they really want to stay in that dark cage, that's what he lets them do. And that's hell. I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis again. The gates of hell are locked on the inside. He's right. The unbeliever crawls in there, locks his front door, goes to his bedroom, locks that door behind him, crawls into his cage, locks the door and says, I will not be defeated. I really believe what you said. It is true. We do not want to accept it. And let me say this again. The irony is, if we live our lives fully understanding the debt's been paid, all accounting has been rendered, there won't be a judgment of my works. There won't be an accounting. You know what will happen? Our lives will clean up. We'll be free. We are free. Uh-huh. We just remember that Jesus' last words were paid in full. And why can't we accept that? You know why we can't accept that? Because we want to say, I want to contribute something. You know, it would be like if someone said, look, here's a mansion and all the money you'll ever want. And we'd say, well, I just can't take that and give you nothing. Look, here's some pocket lint. You know, we think we're contributing something. We're we're not. Well, now that we've seen the path to hell, now let's go back and look quickly at Jude's description and now see how it makes sense 
how this is a perfect picture of someone in hell. Jude 1.12, caring for themselves. God doesn't send someone to hell. What people want is, I want to be by myself with nobody else. I want to be in total isolation, and that's what they get. They are clouds without water. I refer to this many times because I love this. A cloud without water. A cloud with water, there's not much substance there, is there? It seems like there is, but when you're in a flame, you just fly through it, and the plane's not even aware of it. So what is a cloud that doesn't have water? Well, it's still a cloud, but what is it tangibly? Well, remember what we've seen, though? During the unbeliever's life, he's gradually lost his identity as a human being. And so this person in hell, I would say, is not really a human being. He's lost the image and likeness of God. Now he is fully conscious and he will have a memory but slowly he loses his identity as a human being. He's a cloud without water. And is the fact that he's judged 1,000 years later, 1,000 years without God in his life whatsoever, when he's standing before the throne, I don't know what he's going to be like. We don't know, but you're right. At the time he goes to hell, he has been in Hades for 1,000 years minimum. We don't know what that person will look like, but we know one thing. That person will not look like the kind, gentle person that we knew. He's fully retreated into the cage. He's stripped of his image and likeness of God. He wants to be by himself in a cage in darkness, carried along by squalls. Now that means the person will still have these desires. Now, these desires will be fleeting desires and they will carry him along, but that will frustrate him because he has no way to resolve them now. He's an autumn tree without fruit, no joy. Dying, dying, continually dying, but never dies. In fact, he's twice dead. And that refers to Revelation 20:14. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So you see, there's not really a lake, a physical lake of fire. Do you see that? The lake of fire in Scripture was the valley of Hinnom, the basically the garbage dump of Jerusalem where there was a fire. So in that culture, the worst place you could ever imagine was called the lake of fire. Go to the lake of fire. That meant the worst possible place. But this Revelation 2014 makes it clear that the lake of fire is the second death. You see that? This is the second death, the lake of fire. So when people say, what's the lake of fire? It's the second death. It's not really a pit full of flames. For one thing, how could there be outer darkness? We'll see in a minute if there are flames. It couldn't be. Okay, so they're twice dead. That means that in this lifetime, there was one separation. That's what death is. That is the body from the soul. The second separation is at the great white throne, which is separation from everybody, from everything, including the universe. So now the person in hell has got his own little cage, but where is he? He's nowhere. He doesn't even have a body. Just disembodied thoughts. He's uprooted. He's uprooted from God by his choice. He's uprooted from other people by his choice. He's actually uprooted from himself by his choice, from his own body. You know why? That's what he wants. Now what about the punishment? Is God punishing him? No. Jude one thirteen. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own torment like foam. There is the punishment of hell. Whatever degree of rage they have in their little cage, whatever degree of cage rage they have, however mad they are at God for the darkness that they wanted, however mad they are at God for the isolation that they wanted, that's how much torment they will have. They set their own thermostat. Matthew 25, 30, Jesus refers to hell as the outer darkness. That means they're nowhere. In that place, ironically, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that's not regret. That's not people saying, oh, if only I had. Oh, I wish I had. They won't have fond memories of earth. They will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and every time in Scripture we have that phrase, it means rage. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. 
and the word reserved is a middle voice and that means that they made the reservations themselves black darkness what a phrase not just darkness black darkness it will be a suffocating type of darkness that we can't imagine and remember they chose the darkness themselves John 3:19 this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light they chose darkness in this world as they paved the way and at the great white throne I believe for our sake we will see that they with full knowledge they choose the darkness this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men lovingly chose the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil I believe the best way to understand hell, if we just had one phrase, would be in Acts 17, 28. In Him, in God, we live, move, and have our being. Now, hell is the absence of God. So let's do some simple math and we get a picture of hell. Without Him, we do not live, we do not move, and we do not have our being. There's hell. Entities of some kind, C.S. Lewis says they were formerly human. I didn't know what he meant until I started thinking about it. I think that's what he meant. They've stripped the image and likeness of God. So hell is a place without God. There's no life. There's no movement. How can you move when you're not in a place? And there's no being. Now there is existence. There is eternal consciousness, eternal torment. But again, they lose their identity as human being. If I were to picture hell, I would picture as somebody's paralyzed and he's freezing. I think this imagery of heat in hell is exactly the opposite. I actually think Dante got it right in his Inferno when he had hell as increasing layers of frozenness. I believe if we were going to try to picture hell, there's a paralysis and freezing. And think about it. If you're freezing but you don't have, even have a body, what kind of torment would that be? You can't even huddle up in yourself. Think of that. Freezing and no body for all eternity in a black world completely dark and the biggest torment of hell will be the absence of God and that's because no one has an idea what that's like because God permeates the universe now there's nowhere anybody can go where they're not enveloped in God's love and presence if you were to go to Jupiter or Mars where only Jimi Hendrix has been <laughs> you would feel his love and his presence so no person can fathom what it's like to be somewhere where God is not but the pain and torment will be unthinkable and this is I don't have scripture for this let me just tell you my personal belief that if anybody in hell for all eternity ever wanted out and cried out to God I believe God would deliver them the reason I think that is that that's God and that tells me that nobody ever will why because the madder they get the more enraged they get instead of spiraling out they'll just lock the cage in even tighter God's given them what they want would anyone have any desire to be annihilated yeah, I've wondered about that too. I can understand how God does not punish people. In a way, I can understand giving them what they want. But why wouldn't God just annihilate them? Why would God just not cease their existence out of mercy? And the answer is, if God were to do that, He wouldn't be God because that would be sin. That would be destroying something He created. He can't do that by His nature. Another way to look at it is, they don't want to be annihilated. I believe, if, and again, I'm highly speculative, a billion years, although there aren't years in eternity, I don't know how else to say it. If you were to ask someone in hell, do you want this to end, you want this over with, they would say no because they love themselves too much. There's too much self-love for annihilation. I want to close quickly. I want to read a poem to you. It's called Invictus. You may not know the poem, but you'll know the last couple of lines. Written about 1850. Invictus means unconquerable. 
This is one of the most amazing poems I've ever seen because this is a person who has already paved his way to hell and he's right there. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. He's describing himself. Darkness. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. No God's going to interact with me. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. You know what shade is? Black darkness. He's saying, I'm approaching the end of my life, and he's saying, I'm going to hell. Yet... The threat of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate. What he's talking about? The narrow gate that Jesus talked about. It means he heard the plan of salvation. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That will be the attitude of people who march triumphantly to hell and saying, God, you never conquered me. I did it my way. I did it my way. <laughs> and God lets them march off. But I want to just close very quickly by saying that we were spared all that not because of any merit of our own. It's not that God foresaw what good people we would be and chose to spare us. It's not that he saw any promise that we had within us. It's not even that he foresaw that we would have faith in his son. Remember, he created that faith. As a matter of fact, we would have made the same choice if left to our own devices. We would have gone into our house, locked the door, go to our room, lock the door, go to the cage, lock the cage, turn the light out. We would have done the same thing. However, God intervened. And God intervened without our doing anything. Romans 5.8 God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You realize we did not improve. We did not promise to do better. While we were still His enemies, while we were still raging against Him, He died for us in that condition. Now here's the application. Much more than Having now been justified by his blood, justified means declared innocent, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, actually it's the word since, for since while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Let me say that again. It's not after the enmity ceased. You see that? It's that while we were still his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Well, yes, Jesus died for our sins in 31 A.D. None of us in our minds were reconciled to Him then, were we? If you were, I don't want to know. Much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now what that means is, if He would die for our sins while we were His enemies, now that we are His friends... We're not enemies anymore. Now will he ever taste his wrath? If he would not give us his wrath while we were his enemies, is it conceivable he will give us his wrath or judgment while we're his friends? It's unthinkable. And that means we shall be saved by his life. He doesn't mean saved eternally. We were saved at the cross. What that means is his life living within us. The life of well-being possessing power, resilience, and knowledge. And he says, don't let any thought that you will taste his wrath interfere with his life living within you. And he's coming for us soon, and that's what we'll look at next week. Father, we thank you for this picture. Although it's maybe a depressing picture of hell, we thank you that you have clarified what kind of God you are that you're not the kind of God who sends people to hell where they're writhing in agony and flames for eternity. You lovingly give people what they want. Hello, Father, we have to concede that we did not want you. But you fortunately overruled our foolish decision to reject you and drew us to yourself 
to the cross. So we thank you that Jesus died for us while we were still his enemies. And now that we are your friends, we thank you that his life lives within us. And we thank you in Jesus' name this morning. Amen.